Welcome, welcome, fellow Odd Saloners. Thank you for joining me here tonight as I prepare to discuss with you the alleged Arctic conquest of Admiral Byrd. <laughs> Thank you. So who was Admiral Richard E. Byrd, Jr.? Well, if we're getting intimate, first you should know that his middle name was Evelyn. He was a Virginian, born in 1888, a handsome devil, trained in the Navy, and was awarded the Medal of Honor, the highest honor of valor given to, by the United States for his groundbreaking aviation and Arctic explorers, exploring skills. So stick around, this is going to be good. Thank you. Ships! Ships! <laughs> So first we'll cover the Navy part of his career because it was pretty awesome. Because that's where he started racking up medals and letters of recommendation because that was uh, the practice of way things were, were going on there. Basically, this guy won a fuck ton of awards. I cannot tell you. <laughs> From the moment he stepped foot on a ship, he was earning letters of recommendation for bravery and the silver medal of life-saving for jumping overboard twice, fully clothed to save fellow crew members who had gone overboard. Thank you. <laughs> so he rose up the ranks pretty quickly and wound up serving under the likes of Franklin Roosevelt, then the assistant secretary to the Navy. There were also some wars during this time period of course, everyone knows. <laughs> and Richard Byrd became a badass rear admiral who served and survived in both World War I and World War II. Um, and I should also mention, as part of his awards, he was one of the first three people, to, or one of the only three people to be commended to um, admiral without serving first as captain in the Navy. Um, he became, well, uh, and that was um, in, that happened in, on December 21st, 1929. But wait, that wasn't it. <laughs> he wasn't just good at ships. Admiral Richard Evelyn Bird was also a flyer. In 1919, a fellow by the name of Raymond Ortiag offered a prize of $25,000, which, as you can imagine, was a lot in that day, for the first nonstop aircraft flight between New York and Paris. Uh, you might not recognize the name of this prize, but you probably remember the name of the winner, Charles Lindbergh, world famous for his bravery in taking that challenge on. Um, but guess what? Bird did too, <laughs> except that unfortunately he did not win. Uh, <laughs> but he was one of many competitors for the prize, and it took a lot of guts to do something that nev to try and do something that no, no one had ever done before successfully. Uh, and here we come to the Arctic expeditions. Byrd served on three, uh, or led three expeditions. Um, the first beginning in 1928, and it, which included the first flight over the South Pole, which was launched with the co-pilot Bernd Balchin, um, a radio man and a photographer. <laughs> uh, this flight was ultimately successful, taking 18 hours and 41 minutes, during which time they struggled to gain altitude and had to dump empty gas canisters and other emergency equipment in order to reach the height of the Arctic Plateau, which ultimately they did. Uh, the second uh, Arctic trek was short yet treacherous. It lasted a mere five months, but included an emergency rescue operation of Admiral Byrd himself. He went um, five months solo and with only radio communications, somehow alerted his fellow um, expedition members that something was amiss. Apparently he was signing off with things like Cheerio, even when he was suffering from what ultimately was um, carbon monoxide poisoning, once discovered. <laughs> and ironically, uh, in fitting with the theme of doomed, even his rescue mission was doomed. The first two times his team tried to get out to rescue him, they were delayed by weather and elements and only got out the third time, thank goodness. But <laughs> um, our Admiral Byrd survived. Uh, let's see, I'm sorry, I must have skipped over a few. Let's see here. Um, oh, but in terms of the Arctic expeditions, there were the obvious perils, which originally included um, lead poisoning because of the canisters that the food was, was, 
put in. And, but Bird's expedition didn't, succ didn't succumb to lead poisoning. It was uh, more along the lines of, of course, that fa ill-fated carbon monoxide poisoning. And um, yet he persisted. <laughs> and he flew over the pole. Uh, there, there is some controversy surrounding that. Did he fly over the pole or didn't he? Uh, many has, have disputed that fact, mainly because he came back in a record uh, number, a record time, just under 19 hours from which he departed, which seems crazy, um, except that he had tailwinds and his historic reports uh, confirmed that his nav navigational confirmations um, said that he was over the pole. However, he, you know, the idea that this man was doing complex mathematical calculations in his head while flying over the Arctic on no sleep in a plane that had no speedometer is a little far-fetched. <laughs> but uh, we'll give him the benefit of the doubt for, um, for tonight. Um, so he was awarded with, the, uh, with an achievement, with this achievement, even though it remains uh, disputed to this day. Um, we discussed those, and okay, well, I will get, I'll cut to the chase, because the real meat of the story was Operation High Jump. Basically, the United States Army commissioned this expedition and said that it was for scientific purposes, although nobody really knows. According to some far corners of the internet, it was possibly a military expedition, and although no one knows the real explanation of high jump, it is alleged that supposedly Germany was in possession of some um, flying machines that were uh, a little too advanced for the time. They went to Argentina and then went to the North Pole. Supposedly, Operation High Jump was partially scientific at least, but there are speculations Yes, science. But supposedly there are, there are speculations that he was joined by troops of other militaries in order to retrieve these craft. Yes, exactly. <laughs> and although I wasn't able to include it here, there was a headline from 1944 that reported two silver balls from Germany supposedly leaving and going to Argentina. Yes! <laughs> and if you get really interested in things, um, look up the hollow earth theory. <laughs> it um, has a little bit to do with Operation High Jump in that um, supposedly these fly high flying craft were, um, were coming in and out of there. And uh, according to um, some conspiracy theorists, uh, the hollow earth theory involves Agartha and Admiral Byrd, in my research, I watched some of his, um, I watched some of his interviews, and one of the things that he had potentially warned was that if there was a World War III, it would come from high-flying or um, uh, high high-flying capacity planes that would come out of the poles. I did not say that correctly at all, but <laughs> you understand what I'm saying. Um, Yes, and the rumors were that British, British and Russian troops probably were, were joining Admiral Byrd's explanation in order to retrieve these craft. So, the reason why I chose this theme for tonight was because it was doomed. He was given eight months and an unlimited amount of money, an un unlimited budget, and wound up coming back in only eight weeks. He went with a huge um, aviation crew, and a bunch of his planes were reportedly um, disappearing into thin air and just bursting into smithereens. Um, and he was very brave because he still kept going. Um, excuse me. Um, and even though he came back empty-handed, he came back. Eventually he died in his sleep of a heart ailment at the ripe old age of 68. I'll bet you didn't see the story ending that way. <laughs> anyway, I hope that you will join me in raising a glass to Admiral Byrd and all of the explorers everywhere, people who are brave enough to go where no one's ever gone before, and to us for stretching our own limits. Cheers, thank you, to you.